Hey Rob, breaking news. I just found out that our video series is the number one rated AP Computer Science A video review series produced by the College Board on the internet today. That is absolutely true, but we are the only College Board AP Computer Science A review video produced by College Board on the internet today. I think I got all of that that you just said, Tim. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, <laughs> thanks, thanks. Welcome to AP Daily Live, uh, everybody, for the AP Computer Science A 2022 exam. My name is Tim Gallagher from Winter Springs High School in Orlando, Florida. And my name is Rob Schultz. I teach at Bellbrook High School in Bellbrook, Ohio. And we are thrilled to have you all with us today. So welcome back. And again, the whole purpose of our video series here is to get you ready for the AP exam, make sure that you are comfortable and ready to go. So there are no surprises when you take that exam coming up on May 4th. And before we get started, uh, I'd like to actually, uh, we've had we've heard from quite a number of uh, schools that are listening to us. So we're gonna give some shout outs. Uh, we're gonna give some shout outs every day from here on out to the end of the video series. So um, Rob, let's give some shout outs. Uh, okay, so go for uh, it. Where do you wanna start? Well, Westview High School in San Diego. Okay, how about Lexington Christian Academy in Lexington, Massachusetts? Fantastic, shout out to Notre Dame Academy in Hingham, Mass. Okay, welcome to Zumwalt West High School in O'Fallon, Missouri. Uh, Parkview High School in Sterling, Virginia, thanks for listening. And how about uh, Chelmsford High School? I don't have a city or state on Chelmsford High School, but welcome to Chelmsford. There you go, Cass White High School in White, Georgia. Okay, how about, uh, let's see, Franklin Regional Senior High School in Murraysville, Pennsylvania. Awesome, and final shout out today to uh, the Mount St. Joseph Academy in Flower Town, Pennsylvania. Thanks for joining us. Awesome, welcome. So so happy that all of you are with us and, and uh, everyone who didn't get a shout out, we're happy that you're with us today too, so. Fantastic, well, let's get started, Rob, what do you say? I'm, I'm ready to go, let's hit it. All right, so uh, let's talk, start off with what will we learn today and give you kind of an overview. So what will we learn? Well, today uh, we're gonna start with our bit of the day as we do every day, a small bit of information about the exam and we'll start off with the, the free response question general scoring guidelines. Then we're gonna do a, a content review on the relationship between classes and objects. And then we're gonna have our multiple choice question review. We'll go over a few multiple choice questions and we'll end it with our combined table free response question that is from the 2021 exam. And Maggie, of course, is along with us for the ride uh, to help us out. So Rob, why don't you kick us off with today's bit of the day? Bit of the day, all right. Sounds like we've got a lot to cover, so we better jump right in. So let me grab the screen. Okay, so here's today's bit of the day. I wanted to talk a little bit about the scoring guidelines and a little bit about how the free response questions are scored. So as Tim mentioned yesterday, every free response question is graded on a nine point, nine point scale. And there's a very specific rubric that comes with each question and those will be released and put on the website long after all of the exams have been scored. So if you're if you're looking for those right after the exam when the questions come out, you're gonna be disappointed. The, the rubrics don't come out until later. But I want to look specifically at these scoring criteria, these additional scoring guidelines. And you can look these up online. If you do a, a, a search on your favorite search engine for 2021 FRQ scoring guidelines, or we've got the website down at the bottom, you can find those out on College Board's website. I, I realize it's it's kind of a small uh, small screen and, and you know a lot to try and fit. So I wanted to break it apart piece by piece. So first, let's look at the actual scoring criteria rules. Um, it's telling us that uh, applying the question scoring criteria first, which is the rubric, that, that always takes precedent. So if there's anything that um, happens to be a mistake that, that kind of goes along with, with your code that's a part of the question, then it'll be covered on the rubric. So the things that we're going to talk about here in a second are just penalties that might be um, a, a, a mistake or something that happens that isn't really part of the question, but it's still something that could potentially affect your code to make sure that your solution doesn't work quite the way it's supposed to. Um, I wanted to point out a couple different things because my students kind of get this feeling that everything has to be an all or nothing, that they either get it 100% correct or they don't. Um, and the reason we wanted to go through some of these is to point out that you can still get a lot of different points for different things. And we'll talk about that as we go through other free response questions. But these penalty points are only deducted in certain circumstances, okay? So I don't want you to be 
you know, panicked about penalty points. Um, but I want you to be aware that they're there so that you know that there are some pitfalls that you need to avoid. Okay. So um, the second thing it tells us penalty points can only be deducted in a part of the question that's earned credit through the rubric. So what that means is if you earn full credit for part A, for example, we had a, a question yesterday that we looked at that had a part A and a part B. If you earn full credit for part A, but you don't earn any points for part B, and you make one of these one point penalty, uh, you know, errors in part B, you won't lose the penalty point because there can't be a negative score given for any section of a free response question. It's only in a section where you've earned points that you could potentially lose a point through one of these penalty points. Um, it also says that a given penalty can only be assessed once for a question. So if you make the same mistake in part A and part B, you're not going to be docked two points. It's only one point because you made it within the question. Okay, so so once you're deducted a penalty point, it kind of wipes the slate clean for that specific penalty throughout the rest of the question. And it also tells us, and, and I'll be honest with you, and Tim, you can you can share your input on this too. It says a maximum of three penalty points may be assessed for question. I don't think in all the years I've helped score exams, I don't think I've ever seen anyone earn more than one, maybe on a rare occasion, two penalty points. I don't think I've ever seen anybody earn three. At most, I don't think I've ever seen three either. It, yeah. It's really, I think you'd have, you'd have to try to get three points. I, I think, I think so. I mean, you're almost trying at that point. Okay, so next thing I want to look at is the one point penalty. So these are the things that that could cost you a point. Um, and I want to kind of look through them through them step by step here. Tomorrow is the day that we're going to talk about arrays and array lists. Okay, so that's where it's going to be most likely that we're going to see this first penalty. This is array collection and access confusion. So if you're working with an array and you accidentally kind of get arrays and array list confused and you use dot get with an array, or if you're using an array list and you use brackets, okay, even if you do that all the way through your code, um, you're going to have a one point penalty. And the reason that's done is to make sure that if 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 it's something that would affect multiple points on the rubric, you get a one point deduction, you don't lose five out of the nine points because you do that all the way throughout. So in most cases, okay, I can't guarantee every case, but in most cases, if, if it makes more sense to deduct a penalty because you're doing something consistently, then the point penalty will be, will be taken as opposed to taking multiple, multiple points off the rubric. So that's one reason that the point penalties are here. The second one I wanted to look at it is extraneous code that causes a side effect. And the most common one we see of that is printing to output. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be very, very rare on a free response question that you would be asked to produce output to the screen. OK, so I tell my own students that unless you very specifically see something that says that says that you are to display output, you should never write system.out.println anywhere in a free response question solution, because that's extraneous code that causes a side effect. If it doesn't specifically say to, to show output to the screen and you do, it, you're causing a side effect with your code. Um, and, and it's common at times to see um, to see students write little notes in their solution, system that out dot print line, you know, thanks for scoring my exam, things like that, which is nice for the reader, but then it costs the student a point because they added that added that extraneous code. So unless you're specifically asked to produce output, no system that out dot print line. And yesterday we talked about preconditions with our methods. If you do try and put in a check for a precondition and you do it incorrectly, that also costs you a point. So yesterday we talked about the fact that you don't need to check for preconditions. This is one of the reasons why. The first reason is it kind of wastes you know, precious time. And the second reason is if you do it incorrectly, you could cost yourself a point. Okay, if, um, if you use um, local variables within a method that you've created, but you don't declare any, I mean, consistently don't declare any, then that could cost you a point. Um, destruction of persistent data. You know, if you create a method that takes, for example, an array as a parameter and your job is to go through and count the number of occurrences of something within the array, which isn't supposed to change, but then you go through and you, you change things as you go. Maybe you set everything you count to zero. Okay, that's considered destruction of persistent data. So that would cost you a point. And then finally, and this is the one that's probably most relevant to what we're gonna talk about today. Um, if you have a void method, remember yesterday we talked about void methods don't return anything, or if you have a constructor and you include a return value, um, that will automatically be a point penalty. That's not something that's usually checked on, on the rubric, but, but again, you can't do that. So that would cost a point. OK, um, so those are the things that would would just kind of across the board in any of the four free re, um, four free response questions cost you a one point penalty. Um, however, there are some things that maybe in the heat of the moment as you're writing down code, because, again, you're not using a compiler, you're writing things on paper, some things that you could do just kind of accidentally that would not cost you a penalty. And that doesn't mean we don't watch out for them because we want to write um, we want to write 
you know, well thought out, well written code. But if by some chance you have extraneous code that doesn't cause a side effect, um, or you have spelling case discrepancies, and that one I specifically want to talk about a little bit. Um, if you have spelling and case discrepancies where there is no ambiguity, points aren't taken off for spelling. So for example, down here at the bottom, they give a little more description of that one. If, if you're creating an array list and you accidentally spell it with one R instead of two R's, it's pretty clear that you're using array lists. But this is where I tell my students to write meaningful variable names and to be careful with their variable names, because if you use something like capital G and lowercase g, and then maybe later in the program, you use capital G in the Boolean condition of your while when it's supposed to be lowercase g, now that is pretty ambiguous. It's hard, it's hard to tell. Did you do that on purpose or did you do that by accident? So my recommendation would be avoid using single letter, letter variable names and definitely don't use uppercase and lowercase versions of the same letter, right? Meaningful variable names that are descriptive as to what the variable actually is. I, I give my students on a pretty regular basis the don't be cute lecture. This is not the time to, you know, come up with creative, funny, um, you know, fun, fun variable names. Um, this is the time to write well thought out, well written code that that's very, very clear to the person that's going to be scoring it, what the intent of those variables are. Okay, so no, no spelling or case discrepancies. Um, there are some other things in here that that you can go out and look at kind of at your leisure if you want to pause um, things like confusing length and size for strings, arrays and array lists, that kind of stuff. The only other two I really want to focus on um, missing semicolons where your structure structure clearly conveys intent. There's no penalty if you happen to forget a semicolon here or there. And the other one that's a big one um, is if you're missing brackets where indentation clearly conveys intent. If you indent your code as you write it um, on paper and you accidentally forget a closing bracket, there's no penalty for that as long as you've indented everything inside that section so that it's very clear what's supposed to be in your for loop or your if statement or your method. But if you write everything left justified and you close a, uh, forget a closing bracket or an opening bracket, then it's impossible to tell where things are supposed to start and stop. And that will cost you points on the rubric. And it could cost multiple points depending on where the, the bracket's missing from it, how it impacts your code. So I, I have a teacher friend that uses the two finger rule. You know, Anytime they do an open bracket, they put two fingers below the start of that line and they use that as their indentation because then you've got a a really solid gap and it's very very clear what's supposed to be inside and what's indented and what's not okay so um that's that's my bit of the day again take some time and and go out and look through these or pause the video so that you can look through these so that you really get an understanding of 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 where you could lose a point and where you might not lose a point because again we want to avoid any situation that could cost us points on the exam okay all right tim i'm going to pass it back over to you for our review Awesome. Great stuff there, Rob. Thanks, Tim. Um, all right. So here is our review section. And so let's review. So yesterday, Rob was talking about the structure of a class. And today I'm going to focus on classes and objects and methods. Oh, my. So all the different ways that we can now use a class or not all the ways but a lot of different ways that we can use a class we're going to construct objects using these classes we're going to follow some of the methods on the classes we're also going to look at static methods in the classes as well and and then we're also going to start looking at some of the methods in the string class because for a lot of people a uh, string is one of the earliest classes that you start using before you learn how to write a class or anything else. You use a string class to create string objects and use some of the methods on those. And on the AP exam, there will definitely be uh, a lot of questions. You can see them in the multiple choice. You could also see them in the free response where you're going to have to use the methods of the string class in some of your solutions or to answer some questions. So that's what we're going to cover here as part of our review today. So. What we're going to start with first is I went ahead and uh, construct uh, or created a class here uh, called person and I just gave you what we call the interface just the the uh, the names of the methods and the constructors the signature for each method as well. We're not going to focus on the code because we're really just focusing on using this class not writing the class but using this class uh, to create our objects so. Just to look at this, kind of give you a brief overview of, of what we actually have in this class. So we have a public class person. We have a constructor. Uh, you'll notice the header there for the constructor. It has parameters. And we're not showing you the instance variables or anything here, but you'll notice that by the parameters, it looks like a person's going to have a name, an age, and a location. 
We have three methods, get name, get age, and get location. These are my accessor methods, right? These are methods that Rob explained yesterday about methods that return a value. So you'll notice that these don't have a void. These have string or int because that's a type of value that these methods are going to return. And then finally, we've got two mutator or modifier methods. These are going to be methods that change the state of the object. So they're going to uh, change the, the instance variable somehow. Notice one of them has a parameter, a new location. One of them doesn't have a parameter. Have a birthday, we're going to make an assumption that that probably changes the age of the person. So let's take a look at constructing an object using, these class, using this class here. So I've got a couple of construction statements, and these are, are, are pretty straightforward, but let's break these down into uh, in, into each part here and, and what we actually see throughout the contents of these statements. First off, we have uh, where it says person, teacher, and person, student, we have the class name. So whenever you're declaring a class variable, you have to state the name of the class. And then what comes next is the name of the object, the variable that is that references the, the object that you are going that you're going to create here. So I have a person that I'm going to call teacher, and I've got a person that I'm going to call student. After that, we say equals, and then there's a keyword new, and new is what's going to help us construct the object. And we know that the constructor is the same name as the class, so we're going to see that class name again because we are kicking off the constructor here by saying new, and then we're calling the constructor, which is the same name as the class. So we have that class there. And then we have our actual parameters, the values that we're going to put in here. And notice for our teacher, we have Mr. Schultz. Uh, 39 in Ohio. Rob, you're looking great for 39. I left 39 behind a long time ago, Tim. I, I was, I was working me here. I was going to give you 39. I was going to say you don't look a day over 37. But hey, thanks, buddy. I appreciate it. But and hey, and and you're in Ohio. And then we have an another person object, a student. Uh, that's a new person. Uh, their name is Ketavon, 16 in Virginia. And these are two distinct objects, but they're both built using the same class. You can think of the class as like a blueprint that we're using to create these objects. So what are we going to do with these objects now? Well, we can use them. So using our objects, I've just got a portion of a program. You see our public static void main string args. And there's our two lines that we just saw on the previous slide creating our objects. So now what can we do with student and teacher? These are our objects that we're going to now use the methods on. So let's start off with uh, these two lines, I said string location equals teacher dot get location. So what's actually happening here is it's printing um, or by uh, by calling teacher dot get location. I'm using the syntax object dot method. Teacher is my object. Get location is my method. And notice that because this is an accessor method, it's returning a variable. In this example, I'm storing or I'm catching that returned uh, the returned string into a variable that I call location. And then I say system.out.println location. So this will print Ohio because that's the location where our teacher, where Mr. Schultz is in Ohio. That's an example of using object.method. Here's another one. I could say student dot have a birthday. Now notice this is a mutator method with no return type. So notice it's not in part of an assignment statement, I'm not trying to catch anything that gets returned because nothing's getting returned in this statement. I just call object.method again. And in this case, I'm modifying the state of my object. In this case, we're going to assume that this student is having a birthday, so it's going to change their age. So if you remember, our person was named Ketavon, they were 16. So now when I say system.out.println, and here again, I'm calling object.method. Now, in the previous one, I called the accessor methods in and I assigned it to a variable location. Here, I'm calling object.method and I'm calling it right in the context of a print line statement. So, whatever gets returned is going to go right into that system.out.println statement and it's going to print out Ketavon and it's going to print out 17 because student.get name returns the name and student.get age is going to return 17 because remember, I called that mutator that modifier method that student dot have a birthday so even though ketavon was 16 in the constructor when i first called now their state has changed and now student dot get age is going to print 17. okay and so now let's look at one more example where i'm going to do teacher dot change location again that is object dot method so my teacher object i'm calling 
a mutator method again, change location. Notice this time I'm sending it a parameter, Florida. And Rob, you know, it's April, but I, you know, it's too cold up there in Ohio, even in April. So I think you need to move to Florida. So we're going to change your location to Florida here. That would be amazing because in Ohio, you never know about the weather. It could be 70 degrees one day and two to four inches of snow the next. So I would love to come see you in Florida. That'd be great. We can hang out. That'd be awesome. Um, but so now notice what happens when I say printlineteacher.getName and printlineteacher.getLocation. These are my accessor methods. They're going to return values right into my print line statements. And it's going to print Mr. Schultz. And for get location, it prints Florida. So welcome yes. to Printline State, buddy. Awesome. So there's some examples of using object dot method with the class that we saw and the objects that we created. Let's talk about now static methods. And I wanted to bring these up right after our idea of using objects and methods because static methods are methods that we have uh, where we don't use our object dot method convention. We use class dot method. So these are classes that have methods, but we don't have to create objects for those methods or for uh, for those classes in order to use the methods in that class. A great example is the math class. And Rob talked about the math class in the free response question um, last time. And here's a portion of the reference sheet that you'll have with the math class. And we'll talk more about the reference sheet later. But here are some ideas of using some of the math methods because we don't have to create a math object in order to use the methods. So if I wanted to use absolute value or power or square root, I would just say something like this. Here's my print line statement. And notice I say math.abs negative 45 for absolute value and math.pow 2 comma 4 and math.square root 16. And this is where it's using class.method convention, where now when I run this code, it would say 45 and print 16 because 2 to the fourth power is 16. And then uh, the square root of 16 is 4.0. So this is our idea of using static methods. We don't have to say object.method, we say class.method, and we don't have to create an object using that class. And the last part of the review I'd like to talk about today is um, using string objects. So we know that string is a class that we create objects with. Uh, the format is a little bit different. We don't have to say equals new string. We can just assign it a string literal with double quotes. And I've done that here, and I've created a string called word that is equal to the word theater. And I like this word because there's a lot of different words inside of a word here. And off to the side, I, I numbered the, the letters of the word theater uh, with the index values that Java uses. Notice we always were zero based. So the first letter is always letter number zero, uh, up through six in this case, because there are seven letters. And we'll be using strings a lot throughout the next two weeks also. But if you wanted to use some of the methods of the string class on this string object, here are some examples. And again, I'm using the object.method notation that I did before because this is not a static, uh, these are not static methods. These are methods being called on my string object, which is word. So I can say word.length. Length is a method that returns the number of characters in the string. So it'll print seven. Again, these are accessor methods. And word dot substring one comma five if you note from the uh from the substring uh method that you can see up there it returns the substring beginning at index from which is the first number up to but not including uh the number five so substring one five would give me letters one two three and four so it's going to print out the word heat and then index of is kind of the opposite i give it a substring or I give it a smaller string and it tells me where the first location of that string is in my string object. So if I say print line word dot index of eight, A-T-E, it's going to print out three because in the word theater, the word eight, A-T-E, starts at position number three in my string. And there's kind of a brief overview of classes and objects and methods. And we'll be using those a lot throughout the next uh, couple of weeks as well as we're looking at, um, at writing free response questions, answering multiple choice. So it's definitely in your best interest to make sure you're very solid on classes and how you to use them to create objects and how to call the methods on those objects and also how to use static methods as well. So Rob, what do you say? We uh, turn things back over to you and you can uh, help us practice. Okay, and as I'm picking up the screen, I just want to say, Tim, that that was a classy overview.
Rob, I, I appreciate that. In fact, I don't object to that, uh, to that observation that you just made. Nicely done. Nice return. I like that. There you go. Get it the return. See what I did there? Ah, that was right. even better. Wow. We could just keep this going all day. It's, it's, it's you know, it's an all right. infinite loop. <laughs> no, we're we're out of loops. We're we're done with those for for now. Um, okay, so look, let's do some practice. Let's look at a couple of practice multiple choice questions. I've picked out a couple that kind of uh, work off of the the information that Tim just shared. So take a couple seconds and drink all this in. We've got a uh, we're we're considering the following class declaration. We have a class demo that has two private instance variables, one int and one double, and then we have a constructor that takes an int parameter and a double parameter. And we're specifically told there are no other constructors. Okay, so now we've got this following static method example that appears in a class other than demo. We declare a demo object called my object. And then the next step is we're taking my object and we're calling new. So we're, we're using the, sorry, we're using the new keyword and then we're missing the constructor call. Okay, so our goal is to figure out which of the following could be used to replace this missing constructor call so that the method example compiles the way it's supposed to. Okay, so I'd like you to pause for just a couple seconds, take as much time as you need and go through and look at um, look at answers A through E and see if you can figure out which one would be the correct uh, the correct constructor call that we would use to make sure that example compiles correctly. Okay, go ahead and hit the pause button and press play when you're ready to review. And we are back. So how did you do? Um, do you feel like you've got the right answer? Let's take a quick look and see. Okay, so the first thing we've got to keep in mind is that we have two parameters that we have to pass and we're specifically told there no, are no other constructors. So there are no other options. When, when I call the demo constructor, the one and only demo constructor, I have to give it an int and I have to give it a double value. So as we look at our possible answers, well, there we go. I forgot I had the arrows there. We've got int and double. Um, as we look at our possible answers, the first one would be demo with an empty parameter list, but then things don't match up because like I just said, we have to pass in an int and a double. So we know it can't be A. Right off the bat, A is off the table. Um, when we look at B, B looks like we're trying to pass in an int and a double, but we're also declaring a brand new variable P and we're de declaring a brand new variable Q inside our parameter list, which is not valid syntax. So it can't be answer B which also kind of throws out answer C because we're doing the same thing. In fact, in this case with answer C, we're declaring two variables, but we're never really assigning those variables a value that we would be able to pass. So it can't be, can't be answer C either, okay? Um, if we look at answer D, okay, this one looks pretty promising. You know, we're looking for an int and a double. We have an actual int value and we have an actual double value to go with our formal parameters. So that one looks like it's probably gonna be the right answer, but let's double check E just to be on the safe side. When we look at E, this time I'm passing a double value and an int. And even though I could pass an integer value to a double parameter, I can't pass a double parameter to an integer value because the double value is bigger than the int and it, it just doesn't work out. We can't pass a double to an int. Um, so that rules out E, which means D has to be our one and only correct answer for this one. So the answer is four, 13.6 as my parameters within the demo constructor call. Okay, how do everybody do? Everybody get it? I hope so. Let's look at one more. Okay, this one gets a little more involved. This time I've got two different class declarations. I've got a class declaration uh, for a class called point, and it has two private instance variables, two double values that represent the X and Y values of a port, I'm sorry, a point on a coordinate plane. Um, in this case, our implementation of our constructor isn't shown. And it also tells us there are probably some other additional methods there that are, that are, all, that are also not shown. So we don't really need to worry about those. And then we have another class that's a line and the line has two private instance variables. And in this case, they're not primitives, they're actually actually point objects. We've got end one and end two. So the, for the constructor for our line, we have to give it two specific points when we call the constructor. And again, we're not necessarily worried for this question, what it's going to do with those points. What we want to do is we have a client program uh, that says, um, in a specific client program, which of the following correctly declares and initializes line M1 
with endpoints 6.26, 9.3, 13.0, and 8.0. So we've got our, our uh, X and Y value for the first point, and we've got our X and Y value for the endpoint. So our goal is to come up with a line that could be used inside another method somewhere that correctly declares and initializes a line object called M1. Okay, so let's pause again for a second. Um, take some time and look these over and see if you can identify the correct answer from these. Okay, go ahead and pause and press play when you're ready to talk. And we are back again. Okay, so um, the first thing we need to point out is when I call our line constructor, when, when we call our line constructor, we've got to give it two point objects, okay? Um, point P1 and point P2, which means at some point before, or at least during the process of calling our line constructor, we have to instantiate a point object using two double values, okay? So if we look at option A, Okay, option A has our four double values, which we would intend to be our X value, Y value, X value, Y value. But when I call the line constructor, instead of passing in two point objects, this is attempting to pass four double values. So our parameters don't match up. We have to have an exact match. So A cannot be correct. And B is very similar to A. Okay, B, it looks like we're still doing kind of the same thing, but we've added some extra parentheses. The problem is we still haven't actually instantiated point objects. It still looks like we're just trying to pass four double values into our line constructor. So B can't be the correct answer. C looks like it has some potential, right? I'm, I'm instantiating two point objects, P1, and I'm passing it um, a value that's gonna be passed to the A parameter and a value that's gonna be passed to the B parameter. I'm instantiating a second point object called P2 where I'm also passing two double values. But then look what happens when I get down to the, to the line where I'm actually trying to de declare and initialize um, M1. I'm calling the constructor, but I'm still calling it with an empty parameter list. So I have to actually take those two points and use them inside the parameter list. It looks like this solution is attempting to go out and access end one and end two. But again, because end one and end two are not in my client program, they're actually in the line class and they're private, they're not accessible from here. So I can't use option C either. So C can't be a correct answer. When we get to option D, okay, we've, we've already said that the first thing that kind of throws things off for us is um, even though I am instantiating two point objects, um, my parameter list for my constructor is empty, which is a problem. And, and again, this time I am using, if, if my instance variables had been public, this would actually access them, but because they're private, I can't access end one and end two, even though I'm identifying the object that they belong in. So that means D also does not work. So the only remaining choice would be E. Let's double check it and make sure. So I start by instantiating an object P1 with the correct values. I instantiate an object P2 with the correct values. And then I correctly call the line constructor passing in point P1 and P2 as my parameters, which will effectively go over here and we've correctly called our constructor. So how did everybody do? Did everybody get E as the correct answer? I hope so. Okay, Tim, I'm gonna pass it back over to you for our free response question of the day. All right, let's do that. All right, so here we go. Let's look at our example, our free response question. And as we mentioned at the top of this video, our Free response question today is the combined table question from 2021. This is one of my favorite uh, class design or class implementation questions uh, that we've had on an exam in recent years. So uh, let's start off with, uh, this question begins with the, the class single table. And it says that this class single table represents a table at a restaurant. And you'll notice that this class single table, um, we don't see any of the code for any of these methods we don't in fact we don't see the instance variables we don't see the constructors but we just see uh the method signatures here this is really the the interface of the class and you'll notice that uh it looks like there's a get number of seats height view quality so some examples of a single table might be a table that seats four and has a height of 74 centimeters and a view quality of 60. rob i know when i go to a restaurant uh, view quality is always extremely important to me when I get to a table. I could not agree more. I mean, when I go to my favorite fast food place, when I'm just looking for a burrito, I go in and the first thing I look for is to make sure that they have a table with a high view quality. 
I, I need that high view quality. Uh, here's another example. I could have a larger table that seats eight, which is also uh, 74 centimeters, but with a slightly higher view quality of 70, maybe it's closer to a window. And then another table, again, seats four, uh, height of 76 with a view quality of maybe 75. So that's a single, th these are some single table objects and using the single table class, like we talked about earlier in the video. So this question says that at a restaurant, Customers can sit at tables that are composed of two single tables pushed together. And you will write a class called combine table that represents the result of combining these two single table objects. Now, the first thing I want to say is that um, I, I talked to some of my students before when we did uh, this question in class. Some students mistakenly think, oh, this must be an inheritance question. But nowhere in here does it say that a combined table is a type of single table. This is a composition, a, a combined table is made up of two single tables. So that's something that you gotta uh, look for here is in this case, this is not inheritance. This is the idea of where this, the combined table class will contain two single table objects. So that's important to note when we first started here. So notice that it says um, a combined table can seat a number of customers that is two fewer than the total number of seats in the two single table objects. And this is because when we, we push two single tables together, uh, there's, they're going to touch, you're going to lose some seats, right? So here's some single tables. If I push them together to make a combined table, then if I have four seats at one and eight seats at another, my combined table is only going to have 10 seats because two less when you push the two tables together. Combined tables don't have a view quality, though. They have a desirability. And it says the desirability uh, depends on the views and the heights of the two single tables. So if the single tables are the same heights like they are in this example, where the heights are both 74, then the, um, the desirability of this combined table is going to be the average of the two view qualities. So we have a view quality of 60, a view quality of 70. My desirability for this table is 65.0 because that's the average of 60 and 70. So that's one scenario, but what if our two tables are not the same height? So here's an example where I've got one that's 74, one that's 75, you push them together and they don't quite line up. That's not as desirable, right? Um, they still may have a decent view, but what happens when I push these two together? Well, it says the desirability is 10 units less than the average view quality. So here I've got a view quality of uh, of 70 and 75, my seats at my combined table are going to be 18 because 12 and 8, uh, 12 and 8 are 20 minus 2 is 18. But my heights are not the same. At my view qualities then of 70 and 75, the average is going to be 72.5, but my desirability is only 62.5. That's 10 less because nobody wants to get stuck. Rob, I hate that. You get stuck on the two tables where it's not level. You know, one, one of one of my biggest pet peeves. I hate that, and yep. and you can't your 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 plate's all wonky, so you lose you lose uh, desirability points there. So in this question, and like a lot of free response questions, you're going to see some examples. We saw that yesterday with the uh, with the Mississippi as one of our examples. Here's an example of what this um, what this uh, object should do once you've created objects using the combined table class that you are going to write. So as we look through these examples, think about the class that you're about to write. You're going to write the combined table. That means you're going to need what? You're going to need some instance variables. You're going to need a constructor. You're going to need maybe need multiple constructors. We'll look at the example. You're going to need some methods. What methods are you going to need? Let's look at these examples and kind of keep note a little bit so that when you write the class, you'll know exactly what you'll need in order for these objects that you declare or that the examples declare of this class that you're going to write um, how, the, how do they behave? And we're going to see those behaviors right here. So here's our single table objects. Notice in this first statement, I make a combined table using T1 and T2. So there's my constructor. I know I have to write a constructor and look, parameters. So think about how I'd write that constructor. So when I make this combined table object, it's going to have 10 seats. And then the first thing it does here in this example is it says C1.can seat. So, oh, there's that means I'm going to have to have a method called can seat. And it's asking, can I seat nine people at this table? Well, it's going to return true because 
two single tables put together, in this case, have 10 seats. So I can seat nine, it's gonna return true. So it's a Boolean method. What about if I call can seat 11? Well, in this case, I only have 10 seats. I can't seat 11, so it's gonna return false. Think about how you might write that method. Hold that in your brain. So now what about, ooh, get desirability. This is gonna be an accessor method, but let's think about what is going to happen here. The get desirability, um, I'm going to return the average of the two view qualities. It's gonna return 65.0, we talked about that. Um, and that's for these combined, for, for this combined table. What if I have another combined table, C2? Again, calling the constructor, two parameters, two single table objects. It has 18 seats. If I call can seat 18, I can seat 18. It's a big table. I can seat 18 because there's 18 seats, so it's gonna return true. What's the desirability? The desirability is the average of the two view qualities. If the height, but in this case, heights aren't the same as we saw, so it's 10 less, return 62.5. And there's one other behavior that's gonna be important in this class. I can call the set view quality method of a single table. So what if I say T2 set view quality 80, object.method again, and I'm sending it the value 80. So notice the view quality right here on single table T2 is going from 70 to 80. Maybe we moved it closer to the window. What's that going to do now to my desirability of C2? Well, that's going to change. It's going to have to be now 67.5. It's still, they're not the same height. It's still going to be 10 less, but it'll be more because the average of 80 and 75 is now going to be 77.5. Subtract 10 is 67. So what's important to note on this example is that if a characteristics of a single table change, you've got to be able to change the desirability. So that means, think about what that means when I call get desire or I get desirability, I may have to do some recalculation there. So think about how that's going to affect your class. So as I've mentioned, you're going to write the complete combined table class. And your implementation of this class has to meet all the specifications that we talked about. And you should be able to look at these examples. And if I used your class to make these example objects and called these methods, would it work? So we're gonna go ahead and pause. And when you hit the pause button, See if you can take some time to write. Now, this is a complete class. This one's a little bit different than the other free response questions. You would just take that blank free response question paper and write a complete class out, thinking about the methods and the constructors and the instance variables. Take some time, um, you know, 10, 15 minutes if you need to, and uh, write this class out. And we'll come back and we'll see how you did. Go ahead and hit the pause button. Rob, that was a long, that was the longest 15 minutes of my life. That was a long one. I did not have time to go get a burrito, but, and now that's all I can think about is burritos. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. You're, you're welcome. I believe you brought up the burrito example though. So, but th so thank you now for making me want to go to my favorite burrito place as well. Um, so let's go ahead and look at what we're going to call the canonical solution. Now, as Rob mentioned, this is not the one and only solution. There could be some other ones that also are correct uh, based on some items, but uh, we'll talk about things that you must need. And as I go through the solution here, I'm also gonna point out things that, that you would get credit for uh, as you are writing this class when this gets scored out of nine points, as we talked about. So what are we gonna start with? Well, of course, we need to start with public class combined table, right? We need to start with our class declaration. That's the name of our class combined table, open curly brace. And now let's get started. Um, notice that's the class header. So by just by having the class header to get started, you're going to get some uh, to get a point for that. Then we have our instance variables. Now in this case, I've declared two single table objects, table one and table two. We know that's going to get passed in. There may be some other variations where you might have additional um, single table or additional instance variables as well. Uh, I'll talk about that in a second. And then we're going to have our constructor. Now we know that the constructor has to have two parameters, right? So it's a two argument constructor where I'm gonna be passing in a single table, I'm calling it T1, and another single table, I'm calling it T2. They can be named whatever you like. And then of course, we're now going to initialize our instance variables because that's what we do with our constructor. Now you may have said, well, I also 
maybe I calculated the number of seats and I had an instance variable for that too. That would be a possible solution um, that you could calculate the number of seats here as well, but not desirability because that was something that we have to, to change dynamically. So um, there again, it could be some other, uh, some other variations of this that are correct as well, but these are the things that we will be looking for if we were scoring this question uh, on the AP exam. So let's continue on. The next thing we need is our first method. And we know there's gonna be a method called can seat. And we saw from the examples that it takes in an integer value. So I have an integer called n. And that is my complete method header with a parameter. Notice it is a public method. It returns a Boolean type because we know this returns true or false from those examples. And I have an if statement and I'm gonna go ahead and get the number of seats. I'm gonna use that get num seats accessor method that we saw in the single table class using my table one and table two instance variables. I'm gonna call the get num seats method on these objects. Now notice in order to calculate the number of seats, it has to be get num seats from table one and get num seats from table two minus two because that's how many I can see. And as long as that is greater than or equal to my parameter n, I'm going to return true. Otherwise, I'm going to return false. Now, could we have written it differently? We could have done all this in one return statement. Um, Rob, what, would you have done this in one return statement, or would you have would you have written an if statement like this? I, I like the if statement a little better because I feel like it's a little clearer and a little easier to read. But I I think the other one is just as acceptable. They are, and you know, yeah. I always tell my students sometimes you know students like to be concise and it's really concise. They don't want to write more than they have to. However, um, I, I think sometimes in a stressful situation, like taking a long AP exam, writing something like this that is very straightforward, if this return true, else return false, might just logically set better in some yeah. people's brains as a writing out as well too. So again, personal preference, but again, there's different ways to, uh, to write a correct solution for some of these methods. So let's, that was the can seat method. And we have, um, and again, as long as we do return the correct Boolean value based on the number of available seats, we're gonna get credit no matter which correct way we implement that method. So finally, we have our get desirability method. Now this re returns a double, right? It's gonna return the desirability rating, but what's important to note here is we have to calculate the desirability on the tables, the single table objects, as this method gets called. So we have our method without a parameter because there's no parameters. And then we have the body of our code. And again, there's, there's different ways we could do this, but um, here I have an if statement and I'm calling right here in the method, the get height methods of table one and table two. And if they're equal to each other, notice I'm using the double equal sign, then I'm gonna return table one dot get view quality plus table two dot get view quality divided by two, the average of the two view qualities. Notice. I'm calling the get height methods and I'm calling the get view quality methods on our single table objects. However, if the table heights are not the same, then I've got to return the get view quality of table one and table two combined divided by two minus 10 because I want to make sure that uh, the, the, I'm returning the correct desirability. And if the table heights aren't the same, I have to subtract 10 from the average view quality of the two single tables. And you'll get credit for calculating and returning the correct desirability. And there you go, now that's a lot. So how do we do on the class method? Did we, did we have our class name and our instance variables and our constructor and the methods that are required as well as the code and the algorithms that are required for those methods to get those correct? Hope you did well. How'd you do, Rob? I did pretty well. Um, I think as soon as we're done here, I'm going to go find a, find a nice view quality table and I'm going to order a burrito. I think, well, now that you've moved to Florida, we should, we should go together. We should go together. There we go. So Rob, why don't you uh, take it away and tell us what we should take away here? Okay. All right. I'll wrap things up here. Let's see. Let me get back to the screen. Okay, so our takeaway for today, and again, look at all of the, I was gonna say, look at all of the information falling into that folder, but the animation is failing me right now. There's nothing falling into the folder. It looks like it's all been filed away already. Um, 
So we started out with just a quick bit of the day where we talked about our free response question general scoring guidelines. And the main focus of that was just some general pitfalls that you could get kind of caught up in. So we just wanted to bring them to your attention to make sure that that anything out there that could cost you a point here or there is, is something you're kind of watching for that you could avoid. Um, and then Tim spent some time telling us the relationship between classes and objects and how we can how we can use object uh, or use class interfaces to actually work with objects. Um, I spent some time looking at a couple of practice multiple choice questions, and then Tim gracefully took us through the combined table free response question and now has me thinking about nothing but burritos. So, and chips. We need some chips and salsa of with course. our burritos. Of so, course. let's talk a little bit about tomorrow's video. So, tomorrow's bit of the day. Tomorrow will be array and array list day. So, we'll talk about array and array list algorithms. And then we'll talk a little, talk a little bit about the differences between um, for loops and enhanced for loops. Um, again, as we've done um, today and yesterday, we'll look at a couple of multiple choice questions. And then tomorrow, we'll take a look at the member info 2021 free response question, which is the array array list question from last year's exam. So something to look forward to. We hope to see you back tomorrow. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you had an enjoyable time, uh, even though we had a couple of eye rolling little jokes in there, but that's okay. It keeps things interesting. Um, I promise, come back for the dad jokes every yeah. day. Come back for the dad jokes. We're, we're both dads, so they have to be in there. It'll make our own kids roll their eyes a little bit and kind of face palm a little. So, all right. So thank you again. Hope to see everyone back tomorrow. Have a great rest of your day and uh, we'll see you back here tomorrow. Same time, same place. Thanks, everybody. Take care.